So Hiawatha and the pageants, it's complicated, as everything in Native history is. There's no one avenue to tell this story. It's a very complicated story in a very complicated time period of the 20th century. So I've been doing this uh, program, a very condensed version of it, with fourth graders for the last several years with Cindy Oakland, um, peddling with a purpose. So we've been bringing in fourth graders, and we stop at Brown Lake and talk for about 10, 15 minutes about this. So really excited to actually go a little bit deeper with the adult version of this because um, we just can only touch on so many things with the kids uh, but we're trying to bring awareness to what the play was where it, where it occurred um, but there was not just Hiawatha there was these pageants that would go throughout northern Michigan and get into it. so I want to start with the numbers during this time period so I grabbed the 1930 census just to give you some perspective <laughs> of what What's going on in our communities, not just our communities, but communities across the country, um, Native people at the time that these pageants were occurring in the early 20th century represented about half a percent of the Native population in the country, 0.5. Uh, right now, we've increased 1%. We're about 1.5% of the population in this country, so we're going in the right direction but we're still the smallest minority of any population in the United States. And it was even smaller when the Hiawatha pageant was, or play was going on. And I think that's really important because it gives context to why this was such a draw um, in northern Michigan. It was the number one tourist destination in Petoskey was Hiawatha. Thousands of people would go to this play every single summer, thousands. And that's really significant, especially when you think about transportation at the time period. You took the train to get up here, and the train literally stopped at Round Lake, and people would get off and watch the play. So it was a destination. It was well-known. It was well-advertised. The marketing was superb for this. And one of the reasons that people came in droves, in my opinion, was not just for the play itself and the talent and so on and so forth, but there was this idea of the vanishing Indian. It was really prevalent during this time period. But during the early 20th century, there was a very embraced idea in society that Native people were just going to disappear. It was just inevitable that the vanishing Indian was just going to fade away. So people would literally come up here just to see an Indian. It's, it's really bizarre for me to think about going to another uh, part of the country just to see another race, because I think that they're going to be gone in the next generation. But that what was happening here. So we see this really large collection of photos and postcards, especially coming out of this time period. So a lot of the images I'm going to show, actually the vast majority, are from actual postcards. You know, pre-Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. People actually sent posts and said, I'm doing this, this is where I'm at, I had a great time, look what you missed. And so these postcards have become really valuable sources of information that I've been really drawn on in the last several years. And it just seems like there's a, not any supply of these postcards when it comes to these pageants because of not just the visuals, but of the message. And we have to capture this before it disappears. And also during this time period, I, you know, really, really, really strongly in context before we get into our stories, um, a lot of these natives weren't citizens when this play was going on pre-1924. Natives <laughs> would not have citizenship across the board in the United States until 1924 with the Indian Citizenship Act. So some of the people we're going to look at in these photos probably couldn't vote in presidential elections, couldn't run for any federal offices, and this would also inhibit them when they would go and um, have legal cases. A lot of times their cases were thrown out of court because they weren't U.S. citizens. So this is what's all going on in this context in the early 20th century, right here, not just in northern Michigan, but across the country. So I really believe this is really important when we start to see these images. And also, um, Native people, technically, their religion was illegal up until 1978. We had to have a federal law, the Indian Religious Freedom Act. So there's some context of this, where these people are going through and carrying out these quote-unquote activities, but in a lot of cases, they're cultural activities. They're teaching songs, dances, and practices. Otherwise, they would be frowned upon if they did this out in the open, but with these plays and these pageants, it was almost like a, a way to sneak this out into the next generation. So in the early 
first half of the 20th century, Harbor Springs Petoskey was, no surprise, booming with tourists. And you know, O'Dowell were right in the center of this. We were out in the public eye. And thousands would come to see these productions. And it also gave the O'Dowell some economic opportunity, as we'll see. They gave them the opportunity to sell artwork. They would always set up shop at the plays and the pageants. They'd bring baskets, they'd bring quill work, they'd bring beading. So this was an opportunity for the people to make a little extra money and also showcase their heritage. That this is Odawa artwork. This isn't Apache or Navajo or Iroquois. This is Odawa made from natural resources from this area with designs and symbols that are unique to the Odawa. And also that we let people know that we're still here. That we're not vanishing, we're not going away. We're right here in front of you and we're gonna stay here. So the idea of the vanishing Indian played into all of this. But I really want to stress the idea of economics. That a lot of times people just weren't hiring Indians at this time period. Um, was uh, Oral history was relayed to me about 10 years ago, just about downtown here at uh, the main four-way. And there was a large, a larger a metal bench that we somehow inherited in my department. Somebody dropped it off. I'm like, where did the bench come from? I don't know where this is from. Who dropped it off? And somebody from the city dropped it off said, this is that old bench where all the Indians used to sit. Like, okay, let's have a little bit more than an old bench where Indians used to sit. <laughs> and that's the bench on the corner where people would wait as day laborers. So they would wait to say, oh, I can do some plumbing for a day, or I can do some nanny work, or landscape, or whatever. So people, Ogawa people, would hang out and just wait until somebody would come and hire them. And this would go on for years. And that was the actual bench where the people would sit, men and women. And so we're, we're gathering names, and people used to sit at the bench, what kind of jobs that they did. So it's these types of oral histories that you know, reinforce this idea of economic inequality. That nobody would, well not say nobody, but a lot of people wouldn't hire a native person full time, but be okay for a few days work. So these types of activities you know, would really help put food on the table and pay for the bills. So I could have packed in about a thousand images for this tonight. We have just this wealth of Hiawatha. And Hiawatha is a name that everybody is, a, so, I mean, it's a well-known name in Michigan. You have the state, or the federal forest, you have counties, you have townships, you have rivers. Hiawatha is everywhere in the Midwest, especially in Michigan. And Hiawatha is actually an Iroquois word. It's not Odawa or Ojibwe or Potawatomi. It's an Iroquois word. Honor and show me. So, this is where the story kind of gets a little convoluted, a little bit twisted. So the original story is from an Anishinaabe story. And those familiar not, with the, not familiar with the term Anishinaabe, it's the Odawa, um, Ojibwe, Potawatomi together were Anishinaabe. So it's an Anishinaabe story. It's a very old story about one of our main entities, spirits, individuals in our cosmos named Nanabuju. And Nanabuju is everywhere and everything. And it's really hard to pin down Nanabuju because he did all this stuff, but he wasn't human. So there's all these Nanabuju stories throughout our culture. And I'm not going to tell you Nanabuju stories, but I don't have permission. They're sacred stories. And you have to tell stories of Nanabuju when there's snow on the ground. Thankfully, we don't have that. But <laughs> that's the original story. It's a Nanabuju story. Henry Schoolcraft learned of these stories. He was an Indian agent in the 18, early 1800s here in Michigan. Indian agent, scholar, linguist. He was married to an Ojibwe woman from Sault Ste. Marie. And he published numerous volumes of stories and works on Great Lakes tribes. He had an inn, his wife and his family. So they would come and tell him these stories directly and he would write them down. He made quite the name for himself. So Schoolcraft wrote one of these stories down. And then about oh, 40, 30, oh, 40, 50 years later, a guy by the name of Longfellow read the story. And it was taken by it. And he published his own version of the story in 1855, the, story, the Song of Hiawatha. So he took this Anishinaabe story that was from school, the schoolcraft had written, but then he started to manipulate it. And he changed the name because he's from New York, and that's where the Iroquois are from. So he, name recognition. Nanabuju wouldn't sell over in New York like Hiawatha. <laughs> so he took the name, changed it to Hiawatha, and then he just started to take different parts of different stories to add it to this play, this poem. So there's a lot of appropriation going on, and there's a lot of tinkering with the story. 
It became really successful. It became so successful that a man by the name of Louis Armstrong in 1905 said, I'm going to take this on the road, and I'm going to make a production of this, and we're going to act it out throughout the Midwest. And he hooked up with the railroads to help promote this. They had all the transportation already set, and the railroads were looking to double down on their investments of, of railways anyway after the logging had been done. It takes a long time for trees to grow back, and they still had this large investment in railways that, yeah, now we're going to transport people instead of trees. So how are we going to get people to go places? Who doesn't like a good play, a good story? So they really marketed this well to cities like Cincinnati, Chicago, Detroit, Grand Rapids, Lansing. You know, escape all the dirt and grime of the city and come up to this pristine area and see some real natives and hear our native story. And people loved it. By the thousands would come to see the story. But the story has a lot of... Um, twist and turns to it, so to speak, where it began and where it ended up. So it was promoted in Canada, because that's where Armstrong was from. And it goes from a story to a drama. You gotta elevate it, you gotta sell this thing. They also, they also called it the passion play. <laughs> so the wording gets more dramatic as time goes on. And it works, people would come and see this. And Armstrong got his first troupe to do the Hiawatha play from Garden River, which is Sault Ste. Marie. So very local. And he got this, what I call the troupe, of uh, Ojibwe, and he used real natives, which was uncommon at the time. If you look at some of the early film and media, uh, you know, what was depicting... Uh, natives in a lot of these early movies, they're not using natives. They're using other peoples and they paint them up. Uh, but Armstrong didn't do that. He said, no, we're going to use real natives for native stories. Brought them in and they made all their own garb. They made their own props. Everything was handmade. So it's very much a local um, production and they would tour through New York, Michigan, uh, Illinois, all through the Midwest doing this all summer long. Huge draw. And this is from the first group out of Garden River. It's literally an hour and a half from here. And in this photo, you can see that their dress is very, very Ojibwe. The headdresses, those are Ojibwe headdresses. This would change over time. The clothing, the wigwam in the background. We did have teepee style housing, but it wasn't the large plain style teepees you would associate with the Lakota and Mandan and Arikara from North and South Dakota and, and Wyoming, much smaller. So this is accurate because they're using real Ojibwe people. So this is what would have been used, and they were making this out of all these natural resources uh, right at their disposal. And they would pack all this up and set it up at all of the, you know, their gigs, wherever they went, and made sure it was done right, and they actually paid them. So Native people were getting some economic benefit from selling their artwork, but then they would actually pay the people doing the work, which is, you think, common sense, but it isn't. They often wouldn't pay people. So they would tour, and they came here to Petoskey at Round Lake. And so there's a historic marker now on the bike trail where Round Lake is, and it tells you know, a little bit about it, but at least if people are biking and hiking and just going through there, they know that it took place right there. And that's where the place is. Yeah. And these advertisements are all over. They were in newspapers, they were posters, they were flyers. But you can kind of see the imagery change. And in the previous image, the headdresses, these are Ojibwe, Odawa, very similar headdresses. But within a few years when they're advertising, they're going to this long, flowing headdress that's associated with Plains Indians. That becomes the image for natives in the 20th century, no matter what tribe. You have to have the big headdress. That makes you native, that makes you Indian, no matter what. So we're having this outside population really start to create the narrative and imagery of what a native person is. So it's headdress, big headdress, big teepee, horses. And this would perpetuate for the entire 20th century into the 21st century. Now, I still run into people today and they're like, you know, did your people have horses? I'm like, no. 
We didn't have any horses. We had canoes. We fished. There was no buffalo in northern Michigan. Deer, rabbits, fish, lots of fish. So you start to see that idea being pushed um, with these um, basically pamphlets and flyers. And it starts to get local. They start to use local natives for this. And the local Odawas say, you don't have to bring in natives. There's a really large native population in Emmett County, the largest, in fact, in the state at the turn of the 20th century. Emmett County has more natives than anywhere in the state. So Harbor Springs, Cross Village, Goodhart, Charlevoix, the Beaver Islands, including the High Garden, all have native people, thousands. So you don't have to bring any in. We can do this. And they start to use more and more local native people. And really one of the stars of the show is Ella Petoskey. She's a local woman, and she plays the role of Minnehaha. The lead female role. So Ella steps in and starts to take one of the lead roles, and this would open the door for more of the local Odawa to fill all of the roles. And within 10 years, it's 100% a local Odawa production. So they say, okay, you, you brought it here, we know what to do, uh, we can take it from here. And that's exactly what they did. They had ownership of this story, which is for all Anishinaabe people. And this is a postcard of the train dropping people off. This throw throngs of people. As far as I can see, they are lining up for this every summer. I don't know how many times a week they did this. I'm assuming Thursday through Sunday, at least. Depends on the demand. But I, I you know, find it funny that you know everybody's in these real proper dress and like it's a swamp, basically. <laughs> <laughs> is wetlands. So there's lots of bugs, <laughs> and it's in the summer, it could have been that comfortable, but people were willing to sit through this to see the passion play of Hiawatha, and why Agumik is the Odawa name for, for Round Lake. Mm -hmm. oh. But is that the, pardon me, but is that the, they're waiting for the train to take them to Round Lake, or they're waiting for the train to take you, them away? Probably either, either or. Because okay. the train would stop there, then it'd come to Petoskey and then Harbor. And that is, quote unquote, the stadium. So over a thousand people could be seated, seated in that to watch the play. A thousand. That's, that's a big production. And the top level was for viewing, and the bottom level was for food and shops. And they had a tea room, and you could go get some snacks, buy some art, and then you go sit upstairs. So even to this day in this area, you know, packing a thousand people in for one event is still quite a feat. And they were doing this daily at the Hiawatha play. So this building, I don't know what happened to it, where it went, but it was right along the bike path, essentially. And I would love to like, see more photos of this, or even if somebody in their pole barn had, you know, hey, I got one of the beams or, you know, one of the doors or windows. It's, it's a really cool building that nobody would believe ever existed if it wasn't for these photos. You know, middle of really, again, the swamp. Um, but that's where people sat. And inside, this is the lobby. Again, these are all postcards. Hundreds of these postcards are being generated just around Hiawatha. And not just for Petoskey, but for in New York and the Upper Peninsula. There's this whole you know, group of researchers in the Great Lakes devoted to Hiawatha. It's really something. And we share when we can some of the resources, but that's inside the downstairs of the complex, I call it, I guess. So this is, again, one of hundreds of, these are Odawas. Um, don't, don't, haven't identified them yet, um, but they're very local, probably Harbor Petoskey area. They're coming to do this play. And again, you can see the, the, the plain style headdress is being pretty much adopted, uh, the plain style teepee, uh, but the clothing and the, the leggings and all of that is still Odawa. And again, it's a complex time, complex story, where outside of the pageant, Native culture is really being frowned upon. And these instances, they're able to be Native. So they're singing their songs, like I said, they're dancing their dances, 
And this is usually done in Anishinaabemo in our native language. So they're able to pass some of this culture and heritage onto their kids in a time when it wasn't being accepted, oftentimes oppressed. So they're hiding out in the open, and they're being really creative about it. Even just the simple fact of harvesting birch bark. How do I do this without killing the tree? There's a very specific method to this. You know, how to sew buckskin. What do these patterns mean? So they're able to perpetuate some of the culture while having some economic benefit at the same time. And of course, some of these are very staged. <laughs> That's a, I think it's like a birding arrow. These are like fat blood arrows are used for birds or like small game. It's, it's tiny. <laughs> you know, you can see the, the arrow is like a foot long. Um, but this is the type of stuff that sold the play. You know, people would see this and like, yeah, I want, I want to go and see what this is about. Who are these people? These are real, real native people that we're talking here. Not people with paint. Who are the Yodawa? And they would come and then the Yodawa would say, this is who we are. Part of who we are. And actually, I like this photo um, because in the background, you can actually see where they harvest some of the birch bark. So we see some of the more generic, I want to say, postcards coming out of this. But I picked this one because it has some derogatory language. And squaw is the absolute worst word you can call a native female. It's equivalent to the C word in the English language, the really bad C word. But this is the type of things that will perpetuate these stereotypes. Postcards, names of parks and rivers and mountains and so on and so forth. So this was commonplace. So again, complicated. You're having this opportunity to come out and you know, express your culture and show people are still there, but you're still being mislabeled at the same time. And so when Longfellow redid the whole story, in the original Anishinaabe story, Nanabuju just kind of goes away. He's a spirit. He's, he's an unhuman entity. But that wasn't fit a, a passion play. There has to be a, a huge climax. So Longfellow starts to incorporate the Romeo and Juliet angle. <laughs> that Hiawatha falls in love with Minnehaha. But she dies from a disease. He can no longer be with her. And that just can't work in his world, so he takes his own life. He jumps off a mountain. <clears throat> well, Round Lake doesn't have mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so they built one. <laughs> and this is an actual prop that they would use every night to end the, the story through Longbell's version. So in the, in the story, you know, Hiawatha jumps off, and that's the end. But um, they built an actual tower it's like 30 feet tall, and I was just kind of um, discussing this with our fourth graders because Round Lake's like two feet deep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, what happened to the guy who played Hiawatha? He probably had like five Hiawathas. <laughs> Somebody's getting injured every single time. <laughs> or they dug a huge hole where they could make a you know, safe land. But that's how dedicated they were to doing this. That they would build this and you know, build this out um, on this little spit of land um, at Round Lake, and you can see the canoes that they were they were making their own canoes. They built birch bark canoes, 100% organic birch bark, cedar, pine tar. You know, these were 100% made the old way. So in those regards, they were passing on the, these traditions and cultures um, while they were putting on this play. So I had to reacquaint myself with Longfellow's version of this. I haven't read it in a long time. I'm like so put out with it. But I had to come back to it. This is, what the, this is in the last verse. And it really starts to reiterate the vanishing Indian. That you're just going to fade away. And the, whole, the noble Hiawatha, you always got to be noble. This is that noble, savage idea that we're talking about. 
with his hand aloft, descended, held aloft in sign of welcome, waited full exaltation till the birch canoe with paddles grated on the shining pebbles, stranded on the sandy margin, till the black robed chief, the pale face with the cross upon his bosom, landed on the sandy margin. Then the joyous Hiawatha cried aloud and spake in his wise, Beautiful as the sun, O strangers, when you come so far to see us, all our town is in peace awaits you. All our doors stand open for you. You shall enter all our wigwams for the heart's right hand we give you. That's not quite how it was. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of warfare and strife for centuries between Europeans, Americans, and tribes over land and resources. But this paints this picture that everything's fine, and it wasn't. This is the very last verse. Thus departed Hiawatha, Hiawatha the beloved, in the glory of the sunset, in the purple mist of evening, to the regions of the home wind, of the northwest wind, Kuwaitin, to the islands of the blessed, to the kingdom of Honema, to the land of the hereafter, fading away. So this really, again, reiterates the vanishing Indian, the vanishing native. But we did vanish. We're here today. And while the pageant was going on, there was also powwows, and that's a whole different story, a whole different presentation. But I just wanted to show, this is from the 1920s, Cross Village, had the largest powwow in the state for decades. And it's much different than the powwow today. People would just show up and start dancing and singing. So it was very loose. And this guy is doing a very particular dance. I don't know what you want, snake dance, bear dance, eagle, turtle. But they had very specific dances with very specific words. And people are just chilling out on the ground, a little circle of you know, visitors around them. You know, some guys are in full regalia, and some are half, you know, he's got a headdress, and he's got his you know, shirt and his trousers. It's just like it very relaxed. But this is going on the same time that the pageants are going on. But they're different. So this also reiterates that Native people are still here. And I'm from Cross Village, so I always try to include as much Cross Village stuff as possible. I'm a little bit biased, but it's okay. <laughs> Harbor Springs became this epicenter for these pageants. And this is downtown Harbor Springs. And all these different organizations would organize to promote these pageants. And the Michigan Indian Offense Association was one of these organizations. Started out really small. This is the group that did these pageants. And they would do naming ceremonies, not just for their own kids and community members, but they started to perform these naming ceremonies for non-native people, particularly wealthy businessmen from down by Detroit. So this became this bigger event every year until it became so big that they had to, well, they moved around too. So this is one of the renditions of the Hiawatha play underneath the Bear River. So they would condense it to really, really like streamlined versions of the play and have them all throughout the county. So they did it in Harbor Springs, they did it in Petoskey in several different locations, and this looks like mainly just one family, but again, they're showcasing artwork too. That while you're here, you can purchase, but also showcases Odawa artwork. Again, this isn't from any other tribe, this is from this region. And then sometimes you get some leadership from other governments arriving, and this is the governor coming up in 1931, and this is at the old Petoskey um, football field. And they, again, build their own stages. It was multiple versions of this throughout northern Michigan. And this is, I mean, by this point, the headdress is like blowing up. Everybody's got a headdress. <laughs> Even the governor has a headdress. So he just can't get away from them. But again, those aren't Odawa headdresses. But it was native at the time. And I know the one guy in there is Joe Chingwa. I know there's, a, I think, a Kijigo in there, and a Gibson. So these are families that are still with us today who have direct ties to these pageants. Now, their great grandpa or their grandpa was in this or their grandma, and they would come in and tell stories about the time. And it's really rich, you know, to hear these oral histories about, you know, not just the pageant itself, but, you know, there's a really, really good book. Um, it's called The Indians of Hungry Hollow. 
And it talks about Bill Dunlop growing up in the Depression era of Petoskey, being native. And he says there was poor, then there's Indian poor. We were Indian poor. And this really gave us this opportunity to just like make some money because people were literally starving out. So you want to wear a headdress? Yeah, wear a headdress, whatever. <laughs> but they did their thing. And another governor comes up, it's Gerald. Sands headdress, but he's still there. <laughs> the rocket's gotten bigger. They're investing more, but this is yeah, at the old football stadium at the, now in Petoskey. So they needed this type of space because so many people would come to these things. Hundreds, thousands would come and see the, um, the play. Now we get local, right down the road, Ottawa Stadium. Ottawa Stadium was built for these plays. It was built in the 1950s, and it started out as this avid, or this theater for the pageants and the plays. Not for football or soccer or anything like that. It was to accommodate the thousands of people that come every summer to watch this. So this is a, again, these are all postcards. This is a early, like I think the first or second year of the stadium being built. And that's where the football field is. They said this is just a great natural amphitheater. You know, like we can build this very easily into a stadium. And this is from the pageant down at Harbor Springs, and these pageants would go for several days. They would do naming ceremony. Well, the, the end was a naming ceremony. That was the big climax. But they would put on these plays. They put on these shows, and O'Dowell from. The entire region, mainly Harbor Springs, Petoskey, but there was people from Cross Village and Middle Village and probably Beaver Island coming over. Everybody got involved in this, but not every not everybody. I would say endorsed it. There were certain people in the community that said, "We're not, you know, it's not our thing. That's okay." But a lot of people did, and so there's a lot of elements of Odawa culture, but then also a lot of elements of this this I want to say this this Pan Indian idea. You know, you see the teepees and the headdresses. But that's just a byproduct of the time. And you always had a princess. <laughs> so they named these princesses every single year. And it was a you know, point of pride for a lot of the you know, local Odawa. It gave them their own title, their own competition. And that's Kijigo. Again, big family still here to this day. And if anybody's familiar with Indian Hills, um, Victor Kijigo. He's the founder of that establishment. And they go into the night with these. It's 1960. It's late. So this went on for a better half of the 20th century. And then this is from... Um, Louise Leisman, she was a reporter who covered the tribe in the 1950s, so it's kind of a behind-the-scenes shot. Uh, her son donated a large number of her family photos to us several years ago. So she said, this probably serves better here than in my closet. So said, Thank you. So some really nice, rich shots that Louise was doing um, while these were going on. And you know, young people being young people, having fun, dressing up, painting themselves, and again, given the opportunity to express self-identity. This is who we are. Because this was a time of heavy oppression of Native people in the 20th century. So this is from the Mount Pleasant Indian Boarding School in the 1920s. Same exact time these plays and pageants are occurring, saying promoting Indianness, Nativeness, there's federal policy saying you cannot be Native. We're going to take the Native out of you. And there's over 400 of these boarding schools across the country. Information is coming out more and more about them. But Odawa children from this very area went to dozen, at least six schools that we know of. The main three were Mount Pleasant, Holy Childhood right down the street, and Carlisle, which is in Pennsylvania. So there's this real dichotomy going on in this time period of promoting Native, then oppressing Native. And it's, a lot of it's through kids. Like a lot of these kids were using these plays and these productions, but then outside of the play, many of these kids went to these boarding schools. And hundreds of kids, hundreds of Odawa kids from Anna County went to Mount Pleasant. 
It wasn't just Holy Child print. So you can see in this image, there's nothing native with the dress or the hair or anything. Very straight. And this is an image from Holy Childhood, 1955. Holy Childhood was the last boarding school to close in the country in 1983. So I tread lightly because a lot of people in our community are still alive who went to the boarding school. So I just put it out there that it was open. And this is actually from the Leisner collection. She was covering the truck. These are kids arriving to the back of the school. And some of these kids are as young as four or five years old. Some are pre-teens, teens. And by this time period, most of the boarding schools are closed. The whole child was still in operation. So again, exact same time period, these pageants and plays are going on. It's, it's complicated. Can I ask a question? At the end, please. Uh, the, um, did, did they need to, if they want to be educated, did they need to go to one of those schools? Otherwise, there was no education for them? Well, that's complicated, too. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just curious. But. Well, there's different, there was a federal mandate policy about Indian kids going to boarding schools. It started to loosen up in the 20th century where some kids were not made to go to the boarding school. But I'm also finding out through doing the research that local schools weren't welcoming native kids. Yeah. So they had no choice but to go to the boarding school. If they wanted an education. If they wanted an education. Yeah. So we jump back into the plays. This photo is from the Edwidijic family. I mean, Frank Edwidijic, I think, is in this photo somewhere. Oh. That's his dad and grandfather. They were heavily involved, especially Frank's dad. He was one of the main organizers of, of the plays. But Odawa style headdress, clothing, everything. And strict, strict or stark contrast to what's going on at the schools. And this is the Chinghua family. We have a lot of Chinghuas around here. And he's got his whole crew, I think it's out by Middle Village, Goodhart. Got all the kids. All of them are part of this. It's a family affair. And Joe Chima, I mean, he's in all this stuff. Almost every photo, of it, he's like there. He's, he's really active. And these young guys are just looking a little different. And I've never seen guys paint themselves like this, so I had to grab it. Uh, a little bit scary. Um, but it must be part of one of the stories that they're doing or one of the plays. And that's um, Edo Gijic sitting down, and then there's Chinghua again. So this is down at the football stadium. And again, it's another postcard. So I'm always like looking at eBay and you know, different thrift shops and stuff. You know, you just, these things pop up all the time. So um, they're invaluable. And there's a lot of money in this. These wealthy businessmen from Detroit would come up here, and they invested into the, the stadium to help get it built. And they also seen it was a large draw. And part of the whole pageant was some of these guys getting their Indian names at the end of the event. On the last day, the last event, these guys would get their names. Most of them are from Detroit, from what I've seen. So there's a, it's a real interesting mix of local Odawa leadership, Wealthy businessmen, um, your, your kids and your students, you know, coming in and being part of the production. Tourists pouring in. There's a lot of moving parts with, with the Iowa and the pageants. And this is Ottawa Stadium with the, the wooden seats, the old seats. Again, Chihuahua, there he is again. <laughs> um, but I really like this photo because it shows it wasn't just you know, the guys with the big headdresses. It was their kids, their wives, you know, the families would be involved in this. It was a whole community event to put this on year after year. If people really look forward to it, they would come from, like I said, all over the Midwest and also the local community. Like it, it's, it's given them an opportunity to say, we're still here, we're still in our homelands, we haven't been removed. Um, yes, there are some things going on, but we're still in Wyoming. And this is from, a, well, I want to say Detroit Free Press. So one of the big newspapers downstate, they would put all kinds of 
advertisement into this that push people up here. Teepees will be up. See Pippaqua, that's Frank's dad. So this is, like I said, not just the local newspaper, but the big downstate newspapers are pushing this as well. And then they had these brochures that they would hand out every every play or every pageant. Right in the thick of summer, July 22nd, 23rd, 24th. You can't get a better time to do something here than those three dates. Everybody's here. Everybody's coming through. The weather's usually good. Um, so they knew. And so these um, flyers we've been getting in, are let, pretty steadily people have just been dropping off the last 10 years. So they're, they're really nice primary sources. It gives like the agenda, who's speaking, when you know the certain dances and songs are, and you know, it shows just the dynamics of this program. But it wasn't just the pageant and play in Harbor Springs, it was also in Petoskey on, with a different group, and that was the Northern Michigan Auto Association. So the NMOA was this group that was primarily the governing body for the Odawa during the 20th century. And it was run primarily through Robert and Juanita Downing. This is Robert. Um, putting the crown on, uh, the last name is Steele. So they would have their own pageants that weren't involved with the ones at Harper Springs. And they were usually, after they had their large NMOA meetings, then they would have a small powwow and then have the pageant. And they would crown their own princess. So there's different pageants going on at the same time. But everything comes to an end. And so I think this is 60, 61, last show. So by the 60s, these pageants are really winding down. For a variety of reasons, um, powwows are really starting to take over at this time period. They're really starting to pick up. And powwows are, like I said, their own talk, their own, it's their own culture within Native communities is powwows. They really start to ramp up in the 60s and 70s. And it's just, they, you know, things run the course. So the pageants and the plays really, really prominent in the community for the, you know, the majority of the 20th century. But it's a really complicated story. Um, not Like I said, not every Odawa was involved in this. There's like these certain families and groups that were always involved. And they were usually in Harbor Springs, Petoskey. And the powwows were mainly on Cross Village. So it's something I knew about as a kid growing up, but I didn't really understand it. But now being in my position, you know, I've had the time to really study this and um, research it, and the more I research it, the more complicated it gets of, of what was going on um, at this time period. Because I can easily, you know, stand here and say, well, we didn't wear headdresses like that, but I didn't live in that time period. So I have to kind of project myself in that time period of the 20th century, which was a tough time for all people of color, including Native people. And this idea that we're vanishing kept coming up in the research. Um, so I think you know a lot of these Odawa were wanting to show that we're not vanished. We're, we're here, uh, but also this dichotomy of the you know, boarding schools. I had to I had to put that in there. Because they're pushing nativeness in one way, and then in the other way they're saying don't be native. All the same place, same time, literally a mile apart. You got the boarding school where Holy Childhood was, and then the stadium. Same time, same place, literally a mile apart. You can't get more complicated than that. So, people ask me, you think they'll ever bring them back? I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know if I would do pageants again. Um, but it's definitely a part of our story, for sure. You know, here in Harbor Springs, and the fact that we have the stadium built, and a lot of family ties connected to this, it can point back to people who went and participated. And a lot of people have, you know, it's a source of pride. And I, I get it. Like, yeah, we did this on our own, made money, showcased ourselves, took ownership of it. You know, after a while, we said, Armstrong, we don't need to do this. And there was some rifts between the wealthy businessmen down in Detroit who wanted more control over the production. And the local now said, no, this is our thing. <laughs> we don't mind some help, but you're not going to take it over. So that, I think, was one of the leading causes of it starting to dwindle. It just didn't have financial backing. So it just kind of faded away. But like I said, 
it's part of our story, part of our history, and it's part of Harbor Springs. <coughs> and I want to say um, miigwech, yes, thank you in our language for coming out. I've been looking at a computer screen with little boxes with little faces for two years, so to be in person is really nice. <laughs> it's always nice to come back to the Harbor Springs Museum and present and share, and then I'll, I'll try to field some questions. I'm always comfortable saying I don't know, um, so thank you. So the the Hiawatha play during a in a given year summer season how long did those go on did they go on all summer or yeah they, you got any idea what kind of money they made off of it no I don't it'd be interesting to find out I don't know how much money they made what they charge no I don't know I'm curious about the caption demonstrators in the street oh this is um. So, this comes from a scrapbook from one of Robert's sons. So he just kept all of these newspaper articles about his family. And so this demonstrator is, is not associated with the, the pageant. Oh, it's just like, what's, what's going on with Native people at the time? So, no, they weren't demonstrating the pageant. It, it was just part of the you know, old scrapbooks. They cut out of them, cut the pieces out, and they glue them. Which we, we don't really want you to do, but that's what they did back in the day. So that just kind of there. I'm surprised there's not any record of what happened to that structure out around the lake. You know, I think that the logic is that so many things burned, and it was obviously made out of wood that it probably burned at one time. But you know, it seems to me that there should be some record in the newspapers or somewhere what happened to it. It's well, just we, nothing you can find. Not yet. And so it's interesting you say newspapers because we have a staff of three, including myself and my department. And one of us every day is looking for newspapers for stuff, no matter what. So if it's in the newspaper, we will find it eventually. Um, Greenwood Cemetery has been doing a really nice job of digitizing local newspapers. So if you want to do your own Oaken and Prodding, you just go to Greenwood Cemetery. And they went beyond the Toski News Review. They're doing other local newspapers. And you just got to have the fortitude to sit there. And look. I, I can tell you, as a young boy, I went to Ottawa Stadium several times for the pageant there in, in the summer and remember it vividly. It was really quite dramatic, and, and especially at night, because then they do dances and fire dances and things like that. And, and people just loved it. You know, the place was packed. It was production. Yeah, it was really, really something. Yeah, people loved it, and I hear these stories of, you know, that was the best part of their summer is going to this, and the Native community who was involved were, were performers, and they would interact with the crowd. You know, and some of these kids had... As I remember, they were, they were, they were very uh, acrobatic. They were the, the, the dancing and the things that they were doing was pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned a couple times a naming ceremony. Could you share what that is, and is it a, a tradition that persists today? So there's different types of naming ceremonies. For this purpose, for the pageant, they were giving Odawa names to non-Odawa people, non-Native people. So it was a very big visual production. Like they would bring this individual up, you know, bestow them with a headdress, you know, and give them this name. There was a lot of ritual involved with the name. And they were Odawa names. They weren't, you know, from another tribe. And it was this honor to this individual. But then they were doing more old school Odawa naming ceremonies for their own people. So they would name babies at these, or young people. And again, this was not encouraged outside of this event because it was not Christian, it was considered pagan. There was a lot of oppression of beliefs at this time. So they know this is part of the pageant. And so these kids were giving their Indian names and, and you know in the old way in public. So there was like I said, hiding out in plain sight with this stuff. Uh, Eric, as, as you talk to your counterparts around the country, were there other examples of uh, 
uh, such pageants in other native communities? There were, and I'm not just saying this because I'm from here, but I didn't even see anything on this scale. You know, where they would have multiple productions in multiple towns, like Petoskey, Harbor Springs, you know, Round Lake, down at the football field, and to the point where they actually built a stadium to accommodate it. I haven't seen that yet. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Now, there's different types of pageants out west. Uh, I just haven't crossed the Mississippi yet. I, I try to stay east of the Mississippi and keep my nose out of the west. <laughs> But they did have um, certain types of pageants in Minnesota, Wisconsin, similar with Hiawatha, but not like this where it ran into the 50s. Not, not, not that I've seen yet. About the time this was winding down, they were starting the pageant up at the Fort in Mackinac. Did any of this shift to that or any of the natives shift to that? No, the natives are pretty adamant not to be involved with the Fort in Mackinac. They actually protested that pageant or um, several times in the 70s, saying this is not accurate. So that, yeah, kind of just started right when this was starting to spin off. So is that where the Detroit money went, then, was that pageant? I don't think so. I think the Detroit money just kind of faded away. I mean, they, I don't think they funded the one in Mackinac. That's a whole different animal. Um, it's based on an actual event. But no Native people that I know of participated in it. So the Detroit money vanished, the stadium vanished. No stadium the still there. Oh, what was the building that vanished then? Oh, the, the, the Wyagumi. Yeah. Brown Lake. So that building vanished. Yeah. And the pageant itself vanished. But the people didn't. People didn't. Isn't that ironic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, like I said, a lot of this is in family histories where they can point to these photos and like, that's my grandpa. And, Oh, he was this character in this play, and thousands of people went to see him. I mean, that, that's pretty cool. So, Do you have any sense about the historical time period when that building on Round Lake existed, like from year X to year Y, what those years were? My educated guess is 1905 to 1915. That's what's the height of Hiawatha plays on Round Lake. So somewhere, somewhere in there. Uh, is Odawa the same thing as Ottawa? Yep, it's pronunciation. I've been called worse, so <laughs> <laughs> call me Ottawa, I don't care, but it's Odawa is the proper the native. I just, uh, Margie had to leave and she wanted me to tell you specifically that she remembers the parades that mm. took place with these pageants. She said it was. Worse than the 4th of July, but better than the 4th of July. The crowds were worse, but the parade was better. Yeah, they would parade up right through town. It was, it was a big thing. Eric, I was also at those pageants when I was a little girl, so I'm guessing maybe age 7, 8, and 9. And the princess thing was huge. And everybody, all the young summer people wanted to know who the princess, the girls, wanted to know who the princess was going to be. And we would look around the, the women on the field and try to pick her out and whatnot. And like in that photo there, and that maybe I think is Petoskey, the princess is dressed more in a, in a you know, our tradition. But at the Ottawa station, uh, Stadium, she was always in buckskin mm -hmm. and beads and beautiful, beautiful things. And her name was Princess Summer, Fall, Winter, Spring. <laughs> and uh, well, I just remember that it was like a magical thing. Yeah. Yes. And I was a tomboy, I really didn't care about <laughs> princesses, but she, she was really whoever it was, was just a very special. Yeah, it was person. a it was a thing. Like yeah. They would have these competitions and, you know, they'd have credentials, you know, things that they were doing in the community and good standing. And I will say we still have that element in our culture today. They, they crowned a Miss Ogawa at the powwow. Mm. So they brought this back in the last, I'd say, 10, 15 years of having a Miss Ogawa. And young, young usually teen, Ogawa girls, young ladies, you know, they put in an application and they have to show their credentials and 
it's you know what what I do for my community and my family and you know they have a process where they go through the interview you know similar to what they did back then and they get a crown and they carry that for the whole year and they're literally dignitaries from the tribe they go to different events and powwows and you know represent the community so that's been brought back I'm glad you reminded me because that's still the element um, of having that in our community that's very much alive and well. And this is also used by other tribes where they have, I guess we'll have to turn princess, um, but they you know, have these women who win these competitions and they go through you know, all over, sometimes the world, you know, and they go to different countries and they're representing their tribe. Um, so they also, you know, they're very, you know, very, um, they're activists a lot of times where they use their platform to discuss contemporary issues going on in their community. Um, one, such, one such case, I watched this video, the biggest powwow in the, in the world is out in New Mexico. It's huge, it's called Gathering of Nations. Like, nothing compares. And so when that woman wins that one, that's like, you're on the map. Miss Indian World, they call it. So it's like very, very competitive. And this, this young woman won it several years ago and a big achievement, and she used her acceptance speech to sing a song about missing and murdered indigenous women. And it was a stadium with 50,000 people in his dead quiet. So that's the type of, you know, what they're looking for a lot of times. So um, very, very prevalent, though, you know, in our, in our culture. I, I really shy away from the term princess because that becomes this kind of generic, oh, my great-grandma was an Indian princess, and, you know, it kind of permeates into... American culture, but they actually had these young women selected. I don't know the term in Anishinaabe, I don't think it's princess. But that's the kind of term we use today. You know, early on, you showed that uh, the dress was more local. Uh, what, what was the pressure that led to adopting the more plains Indian? That's a whole program unto itself. There was this huge push in the 20th century to create this idea of this homo genius Indian, the one Indian. It's got to have a headdress, got to have a plane. So this was really this concoction and manifestation of American society, government, policy, all of this. It didn't originate from tribes themselves. It was from outside tribes. Of this, is who you, this is who you should be and this is who you're going to be. This is based off movies. It's based off like, um, uh, Wild Bill Cody or Wild, Wild Bill Hickok and show that this is what we're promoting as Indian. And it just kept being pushed and pushed and pushed. Early movies. <laughs> so there's a lot of, got a, break. a lot of uh, different answers for why this was occurring. In my opinion, the native population was so low, it was, it was very easy to put these labels on them at this point in time because there wasn't this diversity or the capability for tribes to express their identity on, on a large scale when you're 0.5% of the population. And then also during this time period of the early 20th century, there was policies in place to make you not Indian, assimilation policies, federal law, like boarding schools. So they're erasing all of this you know, true identity and then when it's convenient, they're manufacturing this broader identity that has true elements to it, of course, but not for everybody. Like here, we didn't have totem poles, and I see them all over northern Michigan. That's a Northwest Coast thing. Yeah. Ida, Clinkett, you know, we didn't have totem poles. The big, giant teepees. Like I've gone to programs before, and the guy's like, well, don't you like to have a horse or something? I've never even really seen a horse in my life. <laughs> I drive a Subaru. <laughs> I wear running shoes. I don't wear moccasins because my feet hurt. <laughs> and it's like all these stereotypes are still prevalent. It's really bizarre. Like, where's your hair? I'm like, it's gone. <laughs> it happened about 42. <laughs> uh, but everybody thinks long braids, dark skin. All of, you know, it's, it's not like that. Is there a powwow now that's open to the public? Oh, yeah. Yeah, powwows are open to the public. You don't need a secret password to get in. Or I've had people really ask me, like, can I go there? It's okay. I'm like, they want 
people to go there. So it's every August, I think the first or second weekend, second weekend in August, it's out at our government property on Pleasant View and Hathaway, open to the public. Yeah, you gotta go, I mean, it's food, dancing, singing. Uh, ours is pretty big, I wanna say it's, 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 it's large. Um, I recommend though, if you're gonna go, go in the evening, because it's hot, I mean, it, it can get really hot in the day. So they have two sessions, one at one o'clock, and then they dance and sing until they call it dinner break, and they reconvene about seven, and they do more, you know, there's certain categories of dance and singing, but I recommend going to the evening because it's just more comfortable. But yes, it's very much open to the public. Is it advertised? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Eric, uh, curiosity on the word powwow, is that a Native American word, or is that a I think it's a, more of a construct. So it had this catchy phrase and like this um, Wild Bill in his Wild West shows. You know, they wanted a catchy word, and that's powwow. So it's stuck. It, it's complicated because it's so ingrained in our culture now. It's, it's like people I know are professional powwow people, that's all they do. You know, they go from powwow to powwow, competing, making money. It, it's a whole different subculture almost. So I don't know what they did during COVID when they didn't have powwows. You know, they, they must have been doing other things, but I think it's more of a construct. Back to the uh, Native American word, what is that? I grew up in the era when the stadium was being built. And the name Dr. Garrity came up so much that he was such a promoter of everything Indian and had been the financial. And so it was one man who had just just really promoted these pageants and, and supported the building of the stadium. I've seen that name in some of the records, yeah. I think he's Detroit area, mm -hmm. I'm not pretty sure. But yeah, they, they were really wanting to push this. Yeah. Hey Eric, did the the pageants at Round Lake cease when the building ended in the, around nineteen fifteen? I, I can't say for sure, but I think so. And that's maybe why there were pageants in other, you know, in Harbor and Long Valley and Pecoski. Yeah, I think stadium. the the local community said we don't need to import natives. You know, we don't bring them from Sault Ste. Marie. We can do this. And when that happened, I, I see more of the productions going to these other places. Yeah. They would still do it at Round Lake, but they started to do it in, you know, at the football field in Petoskey, under the Bear River, started to do it here at Harbor Springs. So there's these multiple iterations of this play. I also heard that the, they went internationally with that. Yeah, some people from the original troupe from Garden River went over to England and Ireland to, to, to carry this on. So yeah, it was it was a big deal in that early 20th century. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, a lot of it's the complication of the, the Longfellow poem. He didn't stay true to the original story, and then there's this this glaring, um, in my mind, in my opinion. The appropriation, you know, again, this non-native take this native story and, and totally change it a lot for their own personal gain. Yeah, they were they were hiring natives to carry out, but you know, the main money is going back to the promoters. So I think there was some of that. And several years ago, I was working with Bank and I'll say to start parks, uh, an exhibit, and one of the exhibits was a movie. Like they wanted to shoot a historic film about the attack on the fort. I'm like, great. They said, we want to use real natives. I'm like, excellent. And then I say, Eric, go find us some native people who will be in a movie. And I thought, oh, easy peasy. I couldn't find anybody. I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be on camera. I don't want to be in front of people. I'm like, okay, so I, I got some people to... But I thought everybody wanted to be. I'm like, no, I don't feel comfortable being in front of, of you know, performing or 
She's like, no, I don't, I don't want to play native. <laughs> so we got real, we had about a dozen or so people, maybe 20. Then we'd have to change costumes to make it look like different people, uh, <laughs> different <laughs> angles, different paint. You know, I'd wear a hat, then not wear a hat. And, but we had to get really creative to, to pull this off. So it was real eye-opening for me. You know, I was literally going to like my inner circle of friends and like calling, you know, I'm in debt now with favors. <laughs> and the one kid, he was so young at the time, but he was like almost six foot, but he was only like 13, so he looked like a you know, man, but he's a boy. They're like, McCoons, you gotta wear a loincloth. Mm. He's like, oh, no, 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 no way, no way, no way. <laughs> this one guy came out, and he had a loincloth on, but you could see it's literally Fruit of the Loom. <laughs> it's like, you gotta take that off, and he didn't like that. He's like, man, this isn't cool. And so we had to find a super thick sash, you know, put around there. And so like, this much thigh is showing. <laughs> And then none of us were like, in, you know, warrior shape, so like, man, we ate too much over dinner. <laughs> it was pretty, uh, pretty uh, revealing, you know, that we weren't ready for that physically. And then uh, my goddaughter, she was like 12 at the time, and she had braces. <laughs> you can't open your mouth. <laughs> and she's 12, she's giggling at everything and laughing. And so she's like laughing like with her mouth closed. It's really weird. So it's like, don't open your mouth in the camera. And then she started laughing. So she had to really watch that. And so lesson is, there's professional people who do this. And they go around and work with parks and stuff. Yeah. Um, Senator Warren, uh, i.e. Pocahontas, um, I don't want to some Indian lineage to get a scholarship. First, I don't How much like, Indian do you have to be to be an Indian? Uh, uh, that's a whole different conversation, and I'm not going to you know, entertain people being called Pocahontas as racist and derogatory. I mean, to label somebody like that is, is really not good. So even though she may claim it, uh, you don't have to call her that. So that's something we've been dealing with for quite a while. Uh, there's people labeling Pocahontas, Chief, Geronimo. Um, how much makes an Indian is a completely different conversation. Uh, one I don't want to get into tonight because it's a very complicated conversation. But we are the only people in the country that have cards that say that you're part of an enrolled tribe, a federally recognized tribe. No other race has this. You don't have a white card or a black card or a Hispanic card. But Native people have to prove a blood quantum to be enrolled in a tribe. So that's part of the complexity of what makes a Native a Native. But I don't want to say that's the defining factor of a Native to have a card, because there's people who aren't part of a federally recognized tribe, yet they're Native. Like, for example, this community did not receive federal recognition until 1994. Now, are you going to say all those people in those photos aren't Native? No way. They're native. They just didn't have federal recognition. So it's a very touchy, complicated conversation of who's Indian, how much makes you Indian. But I, I really don't like when people start to say, like, oh, Pocahontas or Geronimo. Or, that's, I, I just I don't like that. Kind of back to the building. And this is coming off in my head because I was researching something else. But somewhere back in the 30s, to 40, there was a pretty big rail derailment in this area. And it may have happened somewhere around there, caused a fire, and that I was trying to find it on my phone, I can't, but I know there was a huge derailment hit it. Those two trains there. Mm. Oh, I, 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 if you get into Michigan's rail history, you'll find derailments, and there's something here mm. around this area. So that might help you with that building. All right, I, I do see Unfortunately, a lot in the newspapers of people, native and non native, get hit by trains. Yeah. It's like this really common cause of death where people are getting struck by trains, by cars. It's, it's a really common occurrence. Mm -hmm. And again, I encourage you, to, if you haven't read it, William Dunlop's book, Indians of Hungry Hollow. 
I mean, he talks about being in these pageants as a kid. It's a really rich history. It's, you can pick it up at Indian Hills or local books. It seems like when I was doing research on something else, and, and I probably don't remember this correctly, that, that huge building that was where the, you know, that the railroad built that. Probably. You know? So, Makes sense. So maybe looking at railroad history, that might give you some information on that. Yeah. I don't know. Like I said, I'd be, I'm waiting for somebody to arrive in my office. And in my pole barn, I got parts of this thing. I'm really holding out. Somebody must have kept something. Everybody scavenges when things go down. Well, they usually use it to build something else. Yeah, they use it to build something else. I mean, for example, when Holy Childhood was torn down in 2007, there was people all over scavenging. Taking bricks, taking windows, taking desks. And we had, thankfully, people on the ground who were competing with them. Um, metal scrappers, you know, they're getting the metal. Oh, there's tons of metal, copper, everything. So they're literally altercations, physical altercations over stuff. But we had a couple of people who were just collecting. And so we have some desks, some books, doors, some molding, some bricks. And we actually had the printing press that was in the basement. So that's kind of the, the prize that we were able to get. So I, you know, at one point in my career, I would love to you know, be able to reconstruct one of the rooms as much as we could because we have those, those physical materials. So I'm always keen, you know, when I go by a barn or something, like that. you just don't know what's in there. So I'm hoping. Hoping. It could happen. Could happen. So this is just a quick reminder. Um, if you have more questions for Eric, you are welcome to come and uh, come bother him in just a second. Um, but we are going to go ahead and wrap up. And just a quick reminder that on your chairs is a little survey, a feedback form. If you fill that out and leave it for us, you're entered to win a chance for two Harvard History Talk tickets. So please fill those out. And thank you again so much, Eric.